you jumped the train near the town of Hallej. Could you tell us something about how you managed to do so? Well, it was not so much I who managed something, but it was my dear friend, Belle de Vroux. He was a wood cutter, so he cut a hole in the back of our uh, 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 what is it? Uh, and uh, well, that was rather easily done. And the four of us, we came out and we took a stand between the two carriages on the bumpers. And when the train was uh, slowing down. Well, we hopped off one after the other, and uh, with the four of us, it was a difficulty finding each other. But uh, I only met my friend uh, Lindot Kahnenberg, and with the two of us, we moved on. Later on, we met when we were brought together by the Ukrainian partisans, and uh, then we met Belle de Vroux and uh, Franz Brackel. We had small compasses and we had a card and a map and we moved in southerly direction because we uh, un had understood that Hungary would intern us and not hand us back to the Germans. And in the snowy night there's a bright moon, the two of us after we had taken off our emblems and whatever and we looked like, I could say, Ukrainian partisans. If I later saw the picture there wasn't much difference. The first village we met, we thought, well, that's dangerous to go through a village. So we move around. But you know, that's, that's taking, it's time consuming. So the second village we met, we thought, well, we don't do that again. In that hard frost, daylight, we moved just through the village and uh, we passed a school, and there were small children singing a rhyme. And we thought, well, that could be Holland, because in a Dutch school in Holland, they do exactly the same. But nobody uh, paid any attention, and we moved right through. And uh, we were happy that we had passed the first village, and nobody paid any attention to us, probably because we looked like Ukrainians. After we had walked for about what, 12 hours, maybe 10 hours, and darkness came in, then uh, we had to toss and somebody had to knock a door and ask for water and asylum. So uh, I drew the lot and I had gone to a small farmhouse and the farmer opened the door and he said, what do you want? I said, well, I wanted a little bit of water, a bisschen wasser, because it was all frozen in our flask. So we were, I was shown in and I said, but I have a friend over there, could he come in as well? Well, okay, he came in. It was a very small farm and uh, he took off my shoes, rubbed my wet and cold feet and he said, well, everything is all right, uh, you don't have to worry. And I was looking in that one sitting bedroom, kitchen, all at the same place, and uh, I saw a hen cackling out of the bed. And uh, <laughs> I found it funny because it had uh, laid an egg in the bed. And they said, well, the two of you, you go into the bed and we'll sleep on the floor. We said, no, that can't be. You should be in the bed and we'll sleep on the floor. But long discussions, no. We had to go into the bed and uh, well, we slept very well. And the next morning, after we had been waken up, uh, they gave us bread and that one egg hard boiled, they gave it to us. <laughs> that was all they had, uh, probably. It was great uh, warmth and hospitality and they wished us the very best. And uh, we asked them, how do we get, how do we get on now? They said, well, if you are in danger, you go to the police. Now, we didn't like the word police, so we didn't turn to the police. We never saw any police. So we walked on for a second day march. And at the end of that uh, particular day, 
I think that was the the 15th or the 4th, 15th or the 14th of January, I think the 15th as a matter of fact. And we came uh, to a, a little bigger farmhouse and they had one cow. And again they said, well, you take our bed. And we resisted and we said no, but we had to go to bed. And that was about three or four o'clock in the afternoon and we went to bed, the two of us. And then I woke up at about six or half past six in the afternoon. I saw a crowd of people sitting around, all looking at us, at least 20. Could be 15, I don't know. And, uh, well, it's hard to communicate. But then suddenly one of the ladies in the companies said she was French by birth. She had married an Ukrainian. So we could discuss things. So I woke up Leendert and said, well, look. <laughs> I was rather surprised as I was. We had a very nice conversation all together and the schnapps was handed around and I think we got something like rice. It can be rice probably, but I don't know. With meat and lots of schnapps, and you got one glass of schnapps and you had to swallow it and hand it over to, the, to, to your neighbor, and so it went round and round. We were north of the Jester River, and we had, had to cross the Jester River. And that was the, uh, the difficulty, because from the train we had seen that all bridges and crossings over the Jester River were guarded quite well with German uh, soldiers. So we thought we must avoid the bridges. And so we came after a long march again near the Jester River. And uh, near a village we saw small canoes. So we thought, uh, well, let's try and get hold of somebody who can take us over. That was a youngster of about 16 or 17. And he took the two of us in that little canoe and we crossed the Jester River and we continued our trip. I think that was the third day and uh, by the end of the day again we had the problem of finding accommodation. So uh, we came to a quite a big farmhouse, bigger than we uh, had seen before. And there was a cradle hung up on the ceiling and in the cradle was a baby. And there was a rope hanging down from the cradle. And I tell you this, is, it's a minor detail, but I had never seen something like that before in my life, you see. And everybody passing by the cradle, he took the rope and the, the baby, well, she was quite happy by swinging around. <laughs> but that, that was more or less obligatoire to pull the rope <laughs> and make the baby sleep again. So uh, that was quite a pleasant company. And then suddenly there was a heavy knock on the door and uh, two or three people came in and uh, they said, uh, well, what are you? And one of them said, well, you are a German soldier, a deserter. Because we had under our shoes, we had German uh, nails. So uh, we told them that we were not German soldiers and the two of us were taken and uh, we were transported by sledge with uh, a horse and four guardians next to us, Leendert and I back to back and on each side a uh, guardian. And then we were taken to a police station in I don't know what village. And after some time a very tall and lean gentleman came in armed to the teeth with hand grenades and a pistol and I don't know what. And uh, we were taken to a small room, a small, yeah, with a stove, a small stove with wood in it. And uh, then uh, we still, after some small interrogation, he knew already that we were fugitives from a Dutch uh, POW camp. And he took a bottle flask, a hip flask, 
And uh, he said, well, don't you worry, we'll help you. We have uh, already several friends and uh, we'll uh, help you to come to Hungary. Unless, and then he first told us the long story of the Ukrainian freedom movement. And he said, well, we are partisans and we are fighting on the Russian uh, communication lines as well as on, on the German communication lines. And, uh, well, we are daredevils, but we don't have the necessary training, in fact. And uh, it would be of great help if the two of you could join us. And. Uh, well, we didn't decide at the moment, but uh, it was difficult, of course, because Russia was more or less an ally of uh, the UK, France, uh, the States, and, and Holland, of course. And our first aim was to report to our Queen in England, in the UK. So the next day that we told him that we had reflected uh, the idea and that we preferred to go to Hungary and try to find our way to England. Then uh, we were taken to, uh, the two of us, we were taken to another camp. And I don't know if that was now the fourth or the fifth night, I don't know exactly. But that was a huge farm and there I met I think four of our compatriots who had been taken right away uh, by the Ukrainian uh, partisan movement. And in that particular uh, farmhouse, a wedding had taken place the day before. And uh, with the four of us and our uh, guardians together, it was rather crowded in that uh, farmhouse. So they said, the two of you, you go to the bride's room. We said to the bride's room, yes, because there was a wedding yesterday. And there were, uh, were uh, <laughs> well, dried flowers and all that, you know, uh, what happens in a bride's room. <laughs> but how do they accommodate a bride's room? We said, no, we never could do that. We go to the ceiling or to, to I don't know where. But nevertheless, we were f forced to take the bride's room <laughs> and the bride and the bridegroom <laughs> they had to move somewhere else <laughs> and uh, there was a sort of luxury we could shave with warm water and uh, that afternoon uh, we met all together the Ukrainians the six Dutchmen and uh, our guardians but we had a very good time uh, if you look back at they took us to the, uh, well, could I say, four or five kilometers uh, from the border with Hungary. And I think that altogether took about a fortnight, maybe. And uh, then at a distance, I'm, I'm not sure about distances. I don't know names, I don't know names of villages, I don't know names of persons, because you couldn't write down things, of course, and it's that long ago. And then they said, well, in that general direction, there's Hungary. Now, the best of luck, and uh, you'll find your way. But that l those last four or five kilometers, well, that took quite some time. And that was uh, January in the Carpathian Mountains, I think at a height of 1,600, 1,700 meters. So we had guys on ro guides on ropes, and when it was too deep, too s they came back. And anyway, we reached the border and we crossed the border. And they took care of our town transport, they, well, they took care of our safety and uh, giving us the right direction. And uh, they were hard people, brave people. I had the greatest admiration for them. I might recollect that story the uh, Ukrainian hetman gave us about the history of the Ukraine, how they have been struggling against Russia, against Poland, against Germany, and whatever. And uh, then you follow it, but you can't do much. 
when, uh, when I got to England, I, I could tell our premier, that was Professor Garbrandi, but what can he do about it? He was a uh, premier in exile. And, uh, but you can't do much. You can follow the developments. And with nowadays developments, I think we can be quite happy, isn't it? First thought that coming into my mind is a feeling of gratitude to all those who helped us. That started in the Ukraine, but the same applies to Hungary and my Hungarian friends. And uh, well, gratitude, great gratitude for the hospitality, the generosity, and the courage they showed to help us because. That was a dangerous thing to help an uh, fugitive.